why Carl Icahn is known as the most feared man on Wall Street. In New York City in the 1980s, an economic boom period came along and with it, a new generation of investors emerged. Despite growing up with very little in Queens, into the world. You should try to stand up against the trend, even though it might, I mean, literally, it might cost your job, it might cost your promotion. But in the end, think for yourself, be innovative, try. I mean, I'm not telling you go in and tell them what to do. You've got to be careful about that, obviously. Carl Icahn has used a potent combination of misdirection, intimidation, and brute strength of will to become immensely successful. But, but, if you have ideas, go slam the table. Don't worry about it. Come up with your own imagination because that's what this country needs. He's known as one of the most successful takeover artists in corporate history, stripping assets, tricking opponents, and disarming rivals as he has gone, and all of this has resulted in him being recognized as the most feared man in the world of corporate America. I don't think anybody is. I think that we get in, we find that there's problems, and it doesn't always work. And it doesn't work for, you have to wait many years at times. Humble beginnings. Born in Brooklyn in 1936 to Jewish parents, Icon's upbringing was absolutely typical, unremarkable in almost any way. The family lived in a modest home located in Bayside, Queens, New York, and his parents were hardworking people, something they prided themselves on. However, even from a very young age, young Carl wanted something more for himself, something better. Of course, he was a very smart kid, and he knew that nothing like that was just going to be offered to him without him earning it. Carl was quite an antisocial child, who spent his days reading books and rarely interacting with other people. Still, thanks to his insatiable work ethic, young Icon became the top of his class in school and was offered a scholarship to a private school for only the best students. Young Carl knew that this was his chance to begin his journey towards a brighter future, but his parents intervened, turning down the offer on his behalf. The reason that Icon's parents rejected the private school was because they felt that going to a private school might instill a sense of entitlement in their son, that he would become a spoiled brat and lose his attachment with reality. So it was, then, that young Carl Icon went to a public school, far Rockaway High, rather than an elite private school. This made Carl feel for the first time that he was not in total control of his life. He found that the school, which is now closed, was a tough place a real school of hard knocks. Still, Icon continued to study harder than ever, his focus now more than ever on getting into an Ivy League college. Even his teachers discouraged him, telling him that no one from his high school had ever managed to get into the Ivy League. Icon might have seen it as holding him back to have to attend a common public high school, but because of this, he had to become tough, learn how to deal with people, and gain street smarts. This would all serve him well throughout the rest of his life the Ivy League card sharp. Despite the limitations of his education, Icon studied intensely and was rewarded for his efforts by being accepted into Princeton University as the first student at his school to ever make it there. Despite their enormous pride in their son, Icon's parents couldn't afford the expenses of Princeton. They were able to pay the tuition, but Icon would have to find room and board for himself, with his parents strongly believing that he would figure it out. Icon would find a way, of course, but an unconventional one. He played poker, and using his smarts, he would win hundreds of dollars a week. By day, Carl would study philosophy, and by night, he would play poker, but also chess. His efforts, once again, would be rewarded, as when he finally graduated from the school in 1957, his senior thesis titled, The Problem of Formulating an Adequate Explication of the Empiricist Criterion of Meaning, would be awarded the best of that class year. The Independent Thinker As a fairly antisocial youth, Carl Icahn would focus on developing his own reasoning skills, relying on them before listening to anybody else. This is, of course, a characteristic shared by many great investors. As a student of philosophy, Icahn was highly skilled at breaking down his reasoning, dissecting value, meaning, and motive, and bettering himself along the way. However, he found it exceedingly difficult to find work after graduation, having to settle for joining the Army Reserves and working at Macy's as a cashier. However, his wealthy uncle, M. Elliot Schnall, would show him the way to becoming a stockbroker. The market in the 1960s was bullish, and Icon was able to gain phenomenal success in his first year, with other investors listening to his tips and ideas. He had just ten dollars or $15,000 saved when he began, but he made $100,000 in his first year on Wall Street. 
he remained a good student, devouring whatever books and papers he could on the stock market, but something was coming that he couldn't possibly prepare for. In 1962, a decline started that would be later known as the flash crash of 62. On that day, Carl Icahn was wiped out, even losing his money from playing poker. People lost thousands, careers were ruined, but Carl didn't give up. He needed to get back in the game, but he needed an advantage, and that would come from an unlikely source, finding a niche. Icon studied the situation and began to realize that the options market had the potential to be a financial revolution. He also realized that if he got in on the ground floor, he would be able to make himself rich. Finding a job as an option broker for a small, relatively unknown company, Gruntle & Company, he realized that the option sector was full of manipulations and scams, and so he decided that honesty would be his edge. He was also able to provide his clients with greater returns on investment than even he thought possible, and he had struck gold. Soon, he had turned the options business into the most profitable division of Gruntle and had bounced back himself with an estimated income of $350,000 a year, over 30 times the national average. Next, he thought it was time to start his own brokerage firm, Icon & Company, and with that success, his life was set. Icon was able to live a life of luxury, dating fashion models, and spending his holidays in the Hamptons. But now he had gained complete control over his destiny. He wanted more. Icon has never been a man motivated by simply money, but power. Moving into risk arbitrage, he began to wonder if he could see the same successes he had already had with the undervalued corporations. Taking over Carl Icahn had studied the corporate world and realized that the reasons that companies could be acquired cheaply was often due to poor management. His strategy was simple. He would buy into these companies, acquire a suitable amount of stock, and then push for improvements. His time spent playing poker and chess had sharpened his mind to being exceptional when it came to considering variables and strategies, and he always thinks several steps ahead of others. In 1978, his first takeover attempt was to take a controlling stake in Tappan, a small electrics company. His strategic mind helped him here, as he created a false sense of security in the president, pretending that he was naive and didn't know what he was doing, a textbook poker move that helped him gain control. His chess player mind then saw him use conflicting information to confuse management. He said he wanted the company to be acquired, but that he also wanted to remain as a passive investor. This is a confusing and contradictory set of requests designed to cause frustration so that his rivals would make mistakes. Finally, he knew he had to strike fast because when the management had realized his intentions, they created a poison pill, thus diluting the shares. This was Tappan's error as Icon was able to use this to convince shareholders that the management were incompetent. Part of the poison pill is a contract between the company and its transfer agent that if it's triggered, imposes massive economic dilution on the bad actor, the person who's trying to acquire the company or increasing their position in a way that the board doesn't find acceptable. Laying that sentiment into a position on the board. He then threatened the other board members with firing them unless they followed his lead, which they did. And it was then that he forced the sale of the company to Electrolux, doubling his investment and making $2.7 million. Icon had realized that there was immense hidden value in the American system, and that only someone with the guts to challenge the establishment would be able to unlock this. Fortunately, Carl Icon is a man with a lot of guts, street smarts, and an Ivy League education. He knew the time was now, and he knew he could take on corporate America. Still, a new challenge was just around the corner. The Corporate Raider in the 1980s, Reaganomics had saved the United States economy and led to one of the greatest booms in the history of the company. Now married to his ballerina girlfriend, Carl Icahn is amassing huge income from acquiring and selling companies. He needed nothing, having enough money to last him a thousand years, but he was far from done. At the time, airlines were struggling to make profits thanks to intense competition. Believing that Transworld Airlines was undervalued because of strong cash flows, he was sure that if he could acquire it, he could cut costs and make it profitable. At the time, he had built a reputation for being ruthless, and yet he was still able to disarm enemies with his unassuming persona, convincing companies that he is looking out for them. TWA did try to stop his advancement through the company, asking the government to block Icon, but the legislators, tired of TWA's lack of success, sided with Icon. 
TWA would try to find a friendlier buyer, but ended up only with another raider, Frank Lorenzo. TWA offered Lorenzo extremely generous share prices to buy them for Texas Air, and Icon knew that he could walk away with a 100% return on his investment. However, Carl Icon didn't need the money. He wanted to get his way. A master strategist who knew that Lorenzo was tough on unions, Icon went to the unions themselves and leveraged the workers, pilots, and other staff to take a small salary cut in exchange for a piece of the company if he took over. This worked and Icon gained TWA outright in 1988. However, when he acquired TWA completely, he began selling their assets and used the company profits to buy back the public shares, taking the company private. This meant that he also made a huge amount of profit. Those he had used began to question his motives, and this asset stripping made him known as a corporate raider. He was ousted as chairman of TWA. The company eventually went bankrupt in 1997. The Takeover King In October of 1986, Carl Icahn decided to launch an $8 billion hostile takeover for 89% of U.S. Steel, but the bid was dropped in January the following year. In the beginning of the 90s, he sold his stake in the company for a billion dollars, making a $200 million profit. But at around the same time, he sold his stake in Texaco for $2 billion for a $700 million profit. He has since gotten involved in just about every industry there is. Over the next couple of decades, Carl Icahn would invest in companies, take them over and sell them, making huge profits. He has done this consistently for his entire career. And not only has it made him exceptionally wealthy, but it has also increased his profile as a man to be feared in the world of corporate finance. In the 80s, the booming economy created enormous amounts of unprecedented wealth in America, but it also did something else that no one saw coming. It created a new class of investors, those who would do exactly what Carl Icahn did. This new class of investor is known as the takeover artist. An investor or a company whose primary goal is not to improve a company, but instead to identify companies that are attractive to buy, whether because of incompetent management or other reasons for unprofitability, and then turn them around quickly to make a fast profit. Like Icon, takeover artists use debt and leverage to make purchases, before restructuring companies for resale or assimilation into other groups of companies. If anyone objects, the successful takeover artist will simply persist forcing hostile takeovers. But in the 21st century, people began to realize that this way of doing things could actually help corporate America. The thrill of the win. After the housing crisis of 2008 that caused total devastation to the financial and corporate sectors, Icon went on a shopping spree, buying Netflix and PayPal in 2003. He also invested in Apple after being impressed by Tim Cook. He has since made over $2 billion from his initial investment there. At this point, there's little challenge for Carl Icahn in making money. He has become one of the most powerful men in Wall Street history, and while his name carries weight in the same way as Voldemort does, he can make a profit just for suggesting that he might take over a company. But as established, money is nothing to Icahn. Carl Icahn is motivated by winning, the thrill of subduing an opponent, of getting what you want, of obtaining more control. He would likely own the whole world if he could, just so that no one else could have it. Whether you think this is an admirable or abhorrent trait, no one can argue that the man has seen the kind of immeasurable success of myth and legend, and that his name will forever be that of the most feared man on Wall Street. If you enjoyed this look into the story of Carl Icahn, please leave a like on the video and make your voice heard in the comments. Would you do things the same way he did? Also, if you're interested in learning more about other similar people, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss out. Thank you for watching. See you next time.